It is now 7.02 and time for our uh, uh, regularly scheduled Beloit City Council meeting at 100 State Street, Beloit, Wisconsin, in the City Hall Forum, uh, Monday, August 20th, uh, 2012. First item is call to order and roll call. Madam Clerk. Roll call shows all counselors present except for Kevin Levy. Item number two is Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is uh, special orders of the day and announcements. We have none today. Item number four is pl public hearing. 4A. Madam Clerk. A public hearing and proposed ordinance amending the City of Beloit Comprehensive Plan for 220 and 250 Garden Lane. The Plan Commission recommended approval 6 to 0. Ms. Christensen. Um, Jagger Bay has requested two amendments to the future land use plan map for 220 Garden Lane from single family residential urban to community commercial and that 220 Garden Lane is the parking lot and then for 250 Garden Lane from office to community commercial. Um, on <coughs> April 16th they came forward and applied for a rezoning of 250 Garden Lane from PLI to CI C1 which was consistent with the comp plan at that time. I think they told Planning Commission and City Council that the long-term goal was to try to have the comp plan amended to be community commercial so that they could be rezoned to C3 because their future plans um, were more than the C1 uses. Um, Planning Commission did hold a public hearing to consider the requested amendments on July 18th and they voted unanimously to um, adopt the resolution which is included in your packet which would recommend approval of the amendments to the comprehensive plan. Um, if approved, they would still need to come back quote, through this pro through a zoning process to rezone it to C3. Um, this does not rezone the property. This just changes the land use on the future land use plan. Under state law, you're required to, any zoning <coughs> actions are required to be consistent with the comp plan. So this is the, really the first step they have to take in order for council to even consider a rezoning of these properties. <coughs> And Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval. There were no concerns requested by or suggested by Planning Commission about the uses in C3 for this, these particular properties. Thank you. Would anyone like to come forward and speak on item 4A? <coughs> Please come to the podium, state your name and address. Good evening. My name is Kelly Klobes. My address is 4211 South 122nd Street in Greenfield, Wisconsin. Um, I am a managing member for Jacob Bay Properties and we own um, the lots of 250 Garden Lane and 220 Garden Lane and I'm the application uh, or applicant for um, the comprehensive plan change. Um, I know that uh, I met, I came for the uh, Planning Commission meeting in March of this year and then for the City Council meeting um, for the C1 zoning I spoke um, at that time uh, stating that we did want to um, proceed forward with uh, getting C3 zoning if possible um, due to the second floor of the old Rock County Courthouse. Um, they were the courtrooms. So our long-term goal from the time we purchased the property in 2007 was to utilize that second floor as event space. Um, event space meaning just about anything you could pretty much think of that was uh, reasonable um, that people might want to utilize it for. Um, for seminars or business meetings, uh, weddings, um, kids events, community events, uh, markets like craft fairs or things like that um, and so we we had talked to a lot of people over the last five years um, well four years I should say and last year um, we really started moving forward to the point where we knew that we wanted to go through with getting the property rezoned because we needed to rezone it in the first place because it was PLI to um, at least office use to be able to have anybody move in there um, for anything and uh, it was we worked with the city and it was suggested by the city that 
first we go with what the comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan showed, which was C1. Um, that was fine with us because it still would tie into our overall goal of C3. So um, I'm here to answer any questions that anyone may have. Well, let's say uh, we should wait till after we get a, uh, get a motion on that, I think. All right, if you would stand by, I'm sure that uh, we will have some discussion after the public hearing. Okay. Does anyone else wish to speak on item 4A? Final third call for anyone to speak on item 4A. <coughs> Hearing none. We'll start with a uh, motion to, to lay over. This is a first reading. Motion. Moved second. by Lupke, second by Van de Bogart. And Councilor Lupke. My only question was there is not now and there does not intend to be an, a license for liquor on this property or on this for use. That, that's my concern. <coughs> Um, currently, there is no, my brother nor I own a liquor license. Um, we do not intend to get a liquor license. Um, and obviously, if we did, we would have to still come to the city to be approved for a liquor license. So we could be denied at that time, even if we ever plan to intend, which we've talked about it more than 20 times and we definitely do not intend on doing that. There's plenty of people throughout the city and surrounding areas who hold licenses that if they were caterers um, for the event that they would be more than sufficient to supply um, that to the event that would be specific. Thank you. Yes. Councilor DeForest. <coughs> so, um, when you approached this body in March and we heard from neighbors about the concerns about the use of alcohol on those premises, it, sound, it sounds like to me there's a circumvention here that instead of you holding a liquor license, you'll be inviting other vendors in who will be able to use their license to serve alcohol. I'm still hearing concerns from nearby church and nearby daycare, and the neighbors that they're concerned about this this change in the comp plan i mean to me it feels close to spot zoning um, we're not zoning tonight but the comp plan is one step on the way to zoning it and so i you know i'm concerned i certainly i appreciate your investment in this property and i, I appreciate the economic development that would occur but i have to balance that with the concerns that have been very assertively um, shared by the neighbors and trying to preserve the integrity of that neighborhood so um, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about this comprehensive plan change. I just want you to understand why. Sure. Thank you. Any other co counselors have comments or questions? Hearing none, I'll call the uh, motion to uh, lay over till uh, the next meeting. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes uh, six zero. Now on to item number five, citizens, citizens participation. We have reached the point in the agenda for citizens to speak to the council about issues that are coming before us or may come before us in the future. Councilor members may not act on any request at this meeting, but may refer the speaker to staff for assistance. We ask that you hold your comments to three minutes or less and refrain from personal attacks of any kind. I have uh, no sheets indicating anyone wants to speak before us, so I'll call uh, any uh, individuals wish to speak for uh, us on citizens' participation. Second call for anyone to come forward and speak under citizens' participation. And the final call for anyone to come forward and speak to us under citizens' participation. Hearing none, I will we'll move forward to close the citizens' participation and move on to the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered at this point on the agenda. The consent agenda consists of items 6A and 6B. Do I have a motion for approval. Moved by Luke Key, second by DeForest. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes 6 0. 
Item number seven, city ordinances. A proposed ordinance to create section 7.25 sub 9 of the Code of General Ordinances of the City of Beloit pertaining to carbon monoxide detectors. Mr. President, thank you. The uh, state uh, implemented uh, a series of rules <coughs> in the last couple of years regarding carbon monoxide uh, detectors in uh, single and uh, uh, two family dwelling units. Uh, the, the state mandated the presence of carbon monoxide detectors in, in those types of of units at that point and it would be a violation of, of state law not to comply with that as with a lot of uh, the state code the city typically attempts to adopt them as equivalent city violations so that they can be processed in the city's municipal court it, uh, it saves uh, the circuit court uh, if a violation were written today prior to if the council were to adopt this ordinance prior to that action by council, the action would have to be taken by our police uh, or fire folks up to the district attorney's office prosecuted through circuit court. This ordinance merely allows the same violation to be prosecuted and handled through the municipal court uh, here in the city. Um, with that, I'll stand by to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have a move to uh, uh, suspend the rules? Second. Moved by DeForest, second by Lukey. Any questions on suspending the rules? I'll call the matter. All in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Matter passes uh, six to zero. Do I have a motion on the on the merits? So moved. Moved by Spritzer. I'll second on the merits. Seconded by DeForest. Anybody? Any questions? Just, just a comment, Mr. President. Uh, uh, unfunded state mandate coming down from Madison onto local people. That's all. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? I'll call the matter. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Matter pa passes 6-0. Appointments, we have none. Uh, nine, Councilor Activities and Upcoming Events. Let's start with Councilor DeForest. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I had two very fun events that I was able to participate in uh, this past week. One was the Public Works employee picnic to, to thank them, um, to express our gratitude for their service to our city's residents during the storm cleanup, the aftermath. Um, and so we, several of us had the chance to literally serve them by uh, serving them lunch that day to express our gratitude. I served the beans. Uh, I got the most the least popular food item to serve. Um, I think some guys just took the beans because they felt bad for me. Um, but I really want to publicly express my appreciation to our Public Works employees and the way they stepped up. Um, so many of them worked uh, long, long uh, days uh, right after the storm. I also would like to express my appreciation to some of the outlying communities that stepped up to help us as well. Um, City of Janesville and also Edgerton came to our rescue. Um, some of the guys from Edgerton were there, and that was nice to talk with them. It's just nice to see um, that collaboration across municipalities that if there's a need, that we're all willing to chip in and help. So I um, would like to uh, express my gratitude there. Um, I also am looking forward to having pizza with the fire department this week at, at the luncheons and um, to thank them as well for the above and beyond. I, the service calls uh, were an absolutely unfathomable number of service calls received um, the, the first day um, of the storm and into the next day. And then um, finally really enjoyed the Latino Community Fair down at Riverside Park. Um, I got to roll up my sleeve and serve burritos um, and uh, was there most of the day doing that and, and getting to practice my abysmal Spanish um, with many residents there. So I appreciate the Latino Service Providers Coalition for hosting that event and Friends of the Riverfront for also helping to make that possible. And Nikki Myers is just incredible how she reaches out to all members of our community and helps them to feel welcome. So thank you for that event as well. Councilor Kincaid. Um, I have no uh, nothing to report this week. Thank you. Councilor Spritzer. Uh, nothing to report this week. <coughs> Councilor Van de Bogart. 
Just a couple items, Mr. President. I had the opportunity, along with uh, several other counselors, uh, Luke Levy, DeForest, uh, to attend the block parties that occurred uh, almost two weeks ago now. Um, we primarily got to locations, or at least I did, on the west side with a couple on the east side, but they were well organized and a nice opportunity to get out uh, and uh, see individuals uh, in their communities. Uh, also had a chance to attend the uh, DPW uh, picnic the other day, again with Councillor Lupke and DeForest, and also Councillor Haynes was there, uh, again thanking the individuals who uh, uh, participated and worked so hard with the cleanup on the west side. So. <clears throat> Councilor Lukey. Just that, I too was honored to go to so many uh, picnics on the, the night and, and to serve our DPW workers and to attend the uh, Latino Fair on Friday evening. That, that's all. Thank you. I have very little to add other than the fact that I would take exception with Councilor DeForest's statement that she had the least desired uh, item. I was serving sauerkraut. <laughs> and I assure you that that was far less desired than, than her beans. And that'll be that'll conclude. That will conclude the, the, the uh, council activities and upcoming events. Uh, item number 10 is the city manager's presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I'd like to introduce Harry Mathos, the director of water resources for the city of Beloit. He's a division uh, head uh, position within the public works department, responsible for all of the city's utilities, water, wastewater, and storm water. And Harry has a presentation and some of his staff here with him this evening, which he will also introduce. Okay, Harry, thank you. Um, and I would like to echo uh, Councilor Haynes' uh, issue about the, uh, um, oh, what's it, not the beans? Sauerkraut. sauerkraut. I had to carry the sauerkraut away, and you're right, it was not a very popular item. I it was not. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, right now, Steve Woodman, who is our, um, I'm sorry, I have a tendency to walk away from, because I tend to move when I speak, so forgive me if I tend to walk away. Steve Woodman, he's our collection systems engineer, been with the city for 16 years. 16 years. Uh, but fortunately, Brett Abair, who is our, another collection systems supervisor, is a frontline supervisor. Steve is on the engineering side. He sort of designs and uh, uh, works with the um, uh, contractors to, to develop our program, and Brett is sort of the frontline person. So Brett can't be here tonight. He has a, a sick child at home. Um, but to give you, um, I'll take about 10 to 15 minutes of your time to give you an idea of where we're at with the city of Beloit. Um, all, all of you are familiar with what's going on in the city of South Beloit right now. Our friends and neighbors in South Beloit are having some issues with their sewers right now. And they're kind of a microcosm of where we were 25 years ago. So if you take a look at South Beloit and see where we're at right now, it'll give you a good idea of just how far we've advanced and all the work that Steve has put forth and, and everybody else, including our staff, uh, Bud West, who, who currently uh, is retired, he just retired a few weeks ago. He was a long-term city employee. Uh, Cliff Stenielson, Marv Leverens, Tuffy Davis, and Mike Fallon are the crew that works on the streets, the DPW employees. They deserve, a, uh, in a large part, a lot of the work that goes on. They put their hands in and they get the work done. So I also want to take the time to thank them for all the work they do, too. So again, we'll get moving. Again, Steve Woodman, collection system engineer. Brett Abair is the supervisor, frontline, and then myself, who I just happen to be up here uh, talking about it. Um, there used to be a phrase back in the day called the solution to pollution is dilution. Uh, basically, you have a lot of water, you put a little water in it, it, cleans, it magically cleans it up. Well, we've come to realize that that's just not true. Now, if you look back in 1951, uh, the city council in South, on South Bluff Road uh, purchased some land used for a wastewater treatment plant. And only sewage on the west side will go through because the east sewers run so full of rainwater that the material, material is sufficiently diluted to go to the river. That's how we used to treat wastewater. Is simply by dilution. So it just gives you an idea of, of what we're up against and, and, and why we are where we are, why we're treating the infiltration and inflow. This is essential. And Steve, you can jump in any time with any, anything to add. This is obviously the central business district of, of Beloit in 1990. You can see down here is the old wastewater treatment plant. And if you can, take a good look at it because give you a little perspective. Uh, there's a slide coming up in a little bit on the new wastewater treatment plant. But this was the trouble area uh, for, for the city of Beloit. It's uh, the, older, the older sewers pretty much in the city, correct, Steve? Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot of leakers, a lot of problems, a lot of what's called infiltration and inflow, a lot of clear water coming into our sewer system. Of course, the more water that goes in there, the more we have to treat, the more it costs in electricity, and the more it costs in chemicals. So the more we can take out of the system, the easier the plant can function, and it just costs us less money to operate. So that's the reason we take the clear water out of there. And this gives you an idea of just how it infiltrates into our sewer. The large piece right here, 
would be a, a standard sewer. You have sewer laterals that go to businesses, industries, and homes. You have the joints, and you have manholes and the chimneys. And anywhere there's a crack or a seam or a problem, the clear water, which surrounds the pipe or any uh, uh, groundwater, uh, will surround the pipe. It'll enter into the sewer, gets into the sanitary sewers, then we have to pump it down at the wastewater plant. So that's the reason, obviously, we want to get rid of it. And here, gives, this gives you an idea that that in 2008 was a really good example of some of the problems we can have. In 2008, this, this here is a graph of the, this is our influent to the plant. When I say influent to the plant, it's the amount of gallons we're pumping into the wastewater treatment plant. And this is the river level. So you can see as the river goes, so goes the flow to the wastewater treatment plant. What we want to do is minimize that, that rainwater, that river water, or any sort of high water table getting into our sewers. But that just shows just the, the correlation between the river and our sewers. That was back in that was 2000? Okay. And this here, you can see right here, this is just south, or I should say just north of the, uh, the new um, kayak put in, uh, j just south of, uh, of Grand Avenue. There's a storm sewer, and what happens is there's called exfiltration. You've got the river water that will flow back in to the storm sewer, and it will leak out of the storm sewer, and the storm sewers run parallel to the sanitary, so we were getting river water back into our sanitary sewers. It'll leak out of, the, out of the storm sewer right back into our parallel running sanitary sewers. So again, you had rainwater, you had river water, you had, you had groundwater, you had all sorts of water entering into our sanitary sewer system, and we had to figure out a way to block that. And that's what's going on down in South Hawaii right now. That's going to cost them an awful lot of money to repair. Again, they're a microcosm of where we were 25 years ago. So what happened back in March 16th of 1987, most of you are probably aware, um, through, most, for, through much of the 80s, the city of Beloit was under a, a sewer moratorium. They banned construction of sewers, which of course then we couldn't, the city couldn't develop, couldn't build. And obviously that's not a very good thing for the city. So um, in March 16th of 1987, the bans were lifted and we went forth with the construction and planning for a new wastewater treatment plant. All right. So once the ban was lifted, then we were ready to start rocking and rolling and build a new wastewater treatment plant. And of course, this is the new wastewater treatment plant. And if you look at just two of these tanks right here, two of these rectangular tanks right here, they contain more capacity than the entire old wastewater treatment plant. So it just says we're not over-designed, we're just very well-designed. Uh, we have a lot of growth for the future, and obviously that's what we want to do, but we have a lot of growth for the future. We're in very good shape. The plant is now 21 years old, uh, performing very well. It's in very, uh, a very good state of repair, so things are going very well out there. I'm very proud of the work the guys and girls have done out there over the years. Just, again, for where I've come from, and I've said this every time I stand up here, for where I've come from, it's a long way, and I'm, I'm very proud of what they do. Now, what are the benefits of a successful INI program? You minimize electrical usage. That's obviously very critical. The more water you pump, the more electricity you're going to use. 100%, 100 of all water that gets in the sewers has to be pumped two and a half miles up 66 feet. It takes a lot of energy. Yep. Uh, but by also removing the water, we also minimize our chemical usage. At the wastewater treatment plant, our chemicals that we add to disinfect or to, to, to make the water that goes back to the river um, uh, disinfected, we have to treat it with chlorine and another chemical called sodium bisulfite. That's all based on the amount of flow that's going through. Therefore, the less flow, the less chemical we use. Again, saving money. Chemicals are very expensive. Uh, minimize NR101 fees. NR101 fees are, are fees that are based on the amount of I don't want to use the word pollutants, but that's what the DNR uses, pollutants that enter into the river. The cleaner our water, the less money the DNR charges us for allowing it to go into the river. We have to pay a fee for the cleanliness of our water, if you will. The dirtier the water, the more it costs us. The cleaner the water, obviously, the less. So it, it behooves us to keep the water as clean as possible and to discharge as little as possible because the higher the flow, that factors into the calculations. So the higher the flow, the more it's going to cost us. The less the flow, the less it's going to cost us. So again, clear water kills us when it comes to all sorts of fees that the DNR charges. We want to minimize sanitary sewer overflows. Obviously, we don't want sewage in people's basements. Bottom line, that goes without saying. Uh, we also minimize disposal costs for decanted solids, the less solids. If you maybe touch on this one, Steve, I'm not sure which. Well, we, we try to decant our, our vector solids okay. and then uh, dispose of them in the driest oh. way possible. That way we're not transporting oh. water. Okay. Next time we'll have you come up to the microphone. Um, 
we started the study in 2001, and Steve really kicked it off in 2001. It continues today. What we do is we, we uh, televise storm and sanitary sewers. We use cure-in-place sewer lining. It's called CIPP. It's basically a, uh, a, a chemical um, resin that we use to, to line the sewers. Uh, cement lining of defective manholes. Uh, sewer grout sealing of manholes. And you'll see pictures of these coming up. We'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. Bulkheading unused sewers and sewer manhole reconstruction and water main leak location and repairs. Now, Steve, if you want to come up and give an explanation as to exactly what they're seeing. I know. This is a shot with our own TV that we, we uh, recently purchased. Uh, we're going down through a 27-inch uh, storm sewer, and the guys happen to see this line coming in from the right side. They turned, looked up the, this pipe, and you can see a manhole on the other side. That's a sanitary sewer manhole on the other side. This is uh, essentially, it's a legal connection, and we've immediately got that taken care of. But we found a lot of these in the city. So it just illustrates the importance of having the televising equipment. We go in there, we send a camera in there, we can see where we have leaks and problems. And again, the payoff is, in, or the payback is enormous. And this gives you an idea of just how, it, how some of the equipment works. It goes in the sewer, and again, this is a grouting process, Steve. Yep, just basically goes in and just seals all the areas. You have a, uh, say, a crack in the, in the um, in, or I should say at the, uh, um, at the joint in the pipe, you put a little grout around that. If you've got cracks around your manholes, you can grout around there. And again, around your manholes. Again, just a way of sealing. And then when you see uh, some of the contractors out there, you can see here they have this long sort of thread-like piece. That's the, the cured-in-place liner, um, sort of a, a resin-type product that, that, that folds as it goes in. And they have just this most fantastic way of doing it. It goes in, folds, and it just expands. But, yeah, just inversely, it, it just inversely just expands and, and gets a, a coat around the sewer and prevents leaks. So it's just, you know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to pass things around and show like this. It's great if you can ever get out and see, if you ever see it out there, stop and take a look. It's an amazing process. And that's what we've been doing for, for several years. Again, it's a great process, works really well. And the, the, the benefit, when you see in the end here, some of the graphs, you're going to see the benefits are just amazing. And what we also do is we take a spray on grout where we can spray some manholes. And again, it's just another method that we can use to, uh, to seal the manholes. We just take some spray on grout, they sit on top, they spray it in, and just, it just works wonders. And this is our crew right here. One thing I want to point out is in back, our, we have our, our television truck and our manhole rehab. We've taken over a lot of work that we used to let contractors do. We do that in-house now. Uh, we've invested some money, but again, that payback and that investment has been tremendous. When being able to find, instead of hiring out and finding it, we're able to find it ourselves. And, and the staff has become very, very proficient at using the equipment. And that's, you know, obviously the other important part is getting staff well trained in it. They're very well trained. They love using it. And they take a lot of pride in when they do find uh, a problem similar to the one we just saw. They take a lot of pride in finding it and taking care of it. So I take my hats off to our staff. They do a, a tremendous job. So a little rehab summary. Uh, we see IPP lined most sewers in the central business district. Uh, we've abandoned about 51 sewer sections. We've abandoned 82 manholes, and all of these are problem children, if you will. So the, the fact that we abandon them or bulk at them means we can just kind of take them out and we don't have to worry about them anymore. We check them periodically to make sure everything's okay, but it's basically no longer a problem anymore. Uh, we've lined 75 manholes. We've relayed 17 sections, and we've installed many, many bulkheads and repaired many water main leaks again. Um, so kind of here's, in a nutshell, here's, what it's, here's the benefit it's provided. When we talk about emergency call outs that are city issued, it, if, if a resident comes home or somebody comes home, they find uh, you know, maybe some sewage in the basement, which is the worst case scenario of anybody coming home. Back in the year 2000, we would have anywhere from, well, you can see right here, there was about 39 in 2000. We're down to around five a year right now. We've reduced it uh, substantially. Uh, when it comes to uh, chemical, or I should say electrical usage, you can see here the trend obviously is going downward. These are uh, uh, kilowatt hours used at what's called our Northwest Pump Station, which is right over at the site of the old wastewater plant. You can, again, you can see the, the downward trend. Here's the Sherland Avenue Pump Station, which is just across the street from the old wastewater site. Again, the downward trend. We're making very good progress here. This was 1,170,750 kilowatt hours in 2008. We're down to half of that. So again, that was because all, all the streets were flooded downtown. Yeah, so there was a tremendous again, there was a, a tremendous amount of electricity used to pump water 
and, and we've made a lot of strides to, uh, to reduce our electrical consumption. Chemical usage here at the wastewater treatment plant, again, downward, the more water you get out, the better off you are. But there is a, a problem, you know, you get to a point of diminishing returns, and we are actually starting to see that at the wastewater treatment plant. And the first place we're going to see it is odors. I'll just warn you right now, odors will be the first thing we'll see at the wastewater treatment plant, where we've kind of taken pride over the years that it, it's not odor-free, but it, there's a minimal odors. We've taken very few odor complaints from, from the, uh, regarding the wastewater treatment plant. But the less clear water you have, the stronger the wastewater is going to be, and the wastewater is going to generate odors. So we've, we've implemented a, a, a few items. We uh, just completed a project that had odor control um, components. We have yet to put one online. We wanted to see what happened with the first phase to see how it works. Now we're, we'll put the second phase in here soon to see how it works. Although winter's coming up, we'll probably wait till next year to do it, because we've only had one real serious odor complaint. Uh, a uh, lady was driving past the freeway, and she said it smelled. And I take her word for it. There's no doubt about it. But we'll do it in phases and see what happens. But we invest a lot of money, and, and, it, and it will work. So we're kind of at the point of diminishing returns right now. I, I keep telling Steve he can stop any time. Now, we do need a little bit of clear water in there. So, And we have seen some operational, not issues, but there's a change in operations at the wastewater plant now, where before you could kind of sit back and let it operate. Now we have to do a little more process control. So it's kind of, it makes it a little more fun. That's what I have on the sewer part. Uh, Larry asked me to uh, insert one slide on the phosphorus issue. Um, this has finally come to a head. Um, right now, uh, the what's called the total maximum daily load rule is now a reality. It's in effect. Every wastewater treatment plant throughout the state of Wisconsin will have their permit changed whenever that permit comes up for renewal. So, and we're no different. Uh, ours is going to be renewed in 2014. However, we're going to have a compliance schedule where we're probably not going to have to reach the new limit till 2018 or 2022. So we do have time. Uh, right now, our current limit is two parts per million. The new limit will be roughly 0.2 to 0.37 parts per million. So you can see it's a, it's a significant drop. It's very low. Is it realistic? That's, that's obviously debatable. Um, whether it makes sense or not is not for, for me to debate. It's for us to go ahead and take care of. Um, and as probably you're all aware, talking to your professional colleagues, you're, everybody in your position is dealing with the same thing at, at, at many different levels. So it's here. It's a reality. We'll have to deal with it. Fortunately. Um, the, the, the wastewater plant right now averages 0.4 parts per million. So we're, we're almost there. I mean, we're in a very good spot. We don't have a long way to go to get where we have to get to, but we just need that buffering capacity to take care of any high, you know, high and lows and any sort of fluctuations in what we have to do. So there is a, in fact, I, the uh, bids are due on the 24th on Friday um, for an RFP that we let to get a consultant group in here. We're going to talk about what we need to do, and chances are uh, we'll We'll have to go to some sort of chemical polishing. But we're developing a map to that success, and that's where we are right now. We're ahead of the game. In fact, on September 20th, what's called the uh, TMDL group, the Total Maximum Daily Load Group, is having a meeting up in uh, um, uh, Lake Mills to kind of say, well, what are we going to do now? So uh, I don't think it's in our best interest to say, shrug our shoulders and go, I don't know. Let's take a, 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 a proactive approach, take care of business, get it done, and get everything set for the future. So that's my approach anyway. So we can, you know, we could all sit down and talk about it, but I think that's what, you know, I think that's what's best for the city of Lloyd. Absolutely. So let's, you know, move forward and see what we can do. So that's what I have. Now I am ready for any questions and anything that was put forward or anything you want. Councilor DeForest. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. a wonderful presentation. Thanks. Thank you also, Steve. I wanted to ask, because um, obviously we're concerned about TMDL, that's why Larry had to insert it. Right. Um, I just wanted to check with you, because I know we've been uh, dewatering our solids and spreading them locally, which has been a win-win for us, because you know we're it's actually a revenue generator, and we're getting rid of some of our solids. Are we shooting right. ourselves in the foot, though, in terms of phosphorus and nitrates by spreading it locally? Do you think that's an issue or no? Well, I... It... <laughs> It's the shell game. It's, it's been a shell game for many, many years. You either, if you remove the phosphorus from the wastewater, it has to go somewhere. Where does it go? It goes to the soil because we remove the solids in our process, we, and then we land apply it on the farmer's fields. Well, they've created what's called a P-index. Now Now they said, okay, we're, we've dealt with the water. Well, it's all gone to the soil. Now we have to deal with the soil issue. So that's what we're doing right now. And by um, going to the new process, the cake process, that, again, is the first step in a longer process to get us to where we need to be. And that is composting and then class A sludge where we can use it on 
on uh, the golf courses, um, and you can even market it if you so choose. So it's, it's the first step to get where we need to, to truly be and to truly be sustainable is the Class A product. You know, again, that obviously takes money. You I know. just would like to comment um, how pleased I am to hear of the tangible return on investment for the televising equipment. Oh, Very yeah. expensive. You know, we hear a mm -hmm. little flack for that, but um, it certainly has paid off, and I appreciate the crew for their work, and it certainly paid off in the long run in terms of not having to hire out for that. And I think we probably do it uh, do a better job of getting to all the lines on a, on a rotated, regular basis because we have the equipment in-house versus mm -hmm. when we're contracting it out. So I'm yeah. pleased with the environmental results and the the uh, financial uh, cost analysis results. So Absolutely. Yeah, they, they do a wonderful job. Yep. It's, it's money well spent. No doubt. Yep. Thank you. Oh. Your graph showing uh, the uh, continued improvement in, the, in your, your tasks was very impressive. I did notice that uh, in 2002, you seem to be getting ahead of the game. Lower, uh, uh, lower electrical usage, uh, lower, less uh, problems in basements. What was going on then? Well, I don't know, Steve. I think it's bad data. Bad data. Okay. Oh, two, uh, 2002, okay. Yeah. I thought maybe it was a drought or something. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, data can be, uh, you know, statistics are great, but they can also fool you sometimes, too. Thank so. you for your candor. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Van de Bogart. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I also would like to thank you and uh, Steve and the other workers in your division for the outstanding results that you're displaying here. Uh, just looking at the graph on the computer, uh, Sherland Avenue pump station in 2000 used uh, two-thirds more energy than it uh, did uh, last year. And uh, we constantly are uh, regaled in the public uh, in campaigns or in the press to, to make government more efficient and run like a business, et cetera. Well, setting aside an obvious difference that if a business isn't making a profit in an area, they get out of it, and we can't get out of sewage treatment, we are showing consistent improvement in terms of energy usage, chemical usage, the other usages that we have to expend. And uh, we deserve, and you deserve, rather, a, a big pat on the back for an end and add a boy and add a girl for doing a good job. Uh, I'll relay that to him. Thank with you. the... Um, with the another, this is apparently my phrase for the evening, another unfunded mandate in terms of phosphorus reduction. Amen. I would point out that the millions of dollars that your municipalities are going to have to spend in the next few years uh, is, is a, a burden put out upon us by the state government, um, and it's not shared by some of our good friends uh, in the rural communities. And so when you go and compare tax rates and tax this and tax that, uh, you need to keep in mind that uh, we have a whole different set of uh, playing field and playing rules, rather, than do they in, in some of their jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that point. I will. Thank you. Thank you. And just one more quick point regarding the uh, pump station. Steve has also put forth an RFP. We're bringing in a consulting group. Right now, when the plant, the wastewater treatment plant was designed, was designed uh, to pump anywhere to up to 28 million gallons a day. Uh, right now, we're, we're averaging about 3.5 million gallons a day. So we're going to bring consultants in. We're going to take those five 250 horsepower pumps and maybe put in like two smaller pumps to take care of the load that five 250 horse used to do. So again, we're always looking for ways to take care of business like that. Absolutely. So we've got a little ways to go, but we'll get there. Thank you. Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you for the great work with, on efficiency, and, and I definitely think a proactive approach on the phosphorus mandate is the way to go because then we're, we're ahead of the game and, and uh, that's a good place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one question, uh, you were talking about the abandoned sewer sections and abandoned manholes. Can you just uh, help me understand uh, what, what that looks like? How do you abandon a sewer section? What replaces it? Uh, I'll let the expert speak to that. There, in, in the old downtown areas, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, Manholes that uh, are, were uh, sent out to, how should I say this? They're no longer useful. And so we just uh, essentially bulk at them, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, we actually fill the, the unused manholes with sand. And that's all there is to it. Uh, and with the sewer sections, are those just new, new sewer has been laid, or you run the connection somewhere else? or how Right. It? Usually there's a parking lot there or something. Okay. So. And if we need a sewer in the future, we'd have to build a new one. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Lukey. 
Thank you. Good job, Harry. Thank oh, you. thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that. Uh, everyone thanked you, so uh, I, I certainly okay. am going to. Uh, y your, your organization is, is simply uh, uh, miles ahead of professionalism and, and actual execution than any, any other uh, wastewater treatment f facility or department that I, I have experienced in my adult life. So I will let our staff know. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 11, 11A. A resolution authorizing the City of Beloit to partner uh, with the City of Janesville and Rock County through a regional memorandum of understanding to purchase a rescue vehicle for the purposes of law enforcement, amending the 2012 budget and appropriating funds necessary for the procurement of the equipment. Chief uh, thank you. Uh, the department intends to purchase a rescue vehicle with confiscated funds that have been given back to us from the Department of Justice. These are funds that are made available to us from fairly recent drug investigations. Uh, it's not taxpayer money. Uh, it's, it's an incentive for organizations to help with task force and do drug investigations. Uh, this joint venture with the City of Janesville, Police Department, Rock County Sher Sheriff's Office, uh, we think is very important. It's one of the, the uh, tasks that we have been given by the council to partner with other agencies uh, within the county and the area for better services. Uh, this rescue vehicle is a primary platform nowadays for public safety tactical units. Uh, they utilize it for officer safety and that of citizens and rescue situations. Um, our department has been evaluating this opportunity since at least 2004 uh, for the use of a rescue, rescue vehicle. Uh, the opportunity for this joint operation with uh, three agencies was recently renewed um, as an effort to avoid duplication of services and capital expenditures related to tactical operations. Uh, the MOU that we're asking you to, uh, the draft MOU, uh, we're asking you to okay will help solidify the operating parameters that allow the teams to better serve the citizens and officers of Beloit. Janesville and Rock County. Uh, some of the key issues I think that are important uh, we've talked with the staff about is that the MOU will provide for cost sharing uh, with at three jurisdictions within the area. Uh, the funds for purchase come from confiscated funds. It's not taxpayer money. Uh, the rescue vehicle itself is considered a best practices platform for SWAT teams in the United States. Uh, the rescue vehicle provides the safety needed for officers to manage situations involving per persons with high caliber weapons and military training that we're seeing around the country nowadays. Um, and the newer model vehicles, 2009, that we're hoping to purchase uh, is a refur refurbished vehicle that meets all of our needs. And uh, recently, in the last month, this vehicle has become available to us. With that, I'm sure there's some questions. <coughs> All right, well, we'll get a motion to move for a motion vote. Second. Okay. Motion by uh, Luke, second by DeForest. Um, Councillor, questions and comments? Let's start with uh, Councillor Van de uh, Thank you. Chief, can you tell us uh, what is the approximate or anticipated lifespan of this vehicle? Approximately 15 years. Uh, the 2009 model is much better than the older model that, that was available. And during that lifespan, my reading of the Memorandum of Understanding talks about uh, the city of Beloit being responsible for the maintenance of the vehicle. What are the ongoing maintenance costs and, and how will they be affected by <laughs> your budget going forward? Uh, the vehicle maintenance will be the responsibility of the Beloit Police Department. We anticipate uh, replacement of tires, um, uh, some engine work, it's a diesel engine, should, shouldn't need a lot of repair work. Um, as far as damage to the vehicle, that would be the responsibility if damage occurs during operation by whatever agency is using yeah, it at I read the that. time. Yeah. No. Uh, we, and we would use, be able to use confiscated funds uh, on a yearly basis for the maintenance. That's part of the agreement. All right, and then you mentioned the funds issue. Um, as I understand, the source of the funds is a DOJ reimbursement for, for monies that uh, were involved in drugs, presumably from here. 
what other uses could be used and how did you prioritize or did you prioritize other uses for this possible uh, windfall from uh, other sources? I'm thinking particularly of oh, items like shot spot or, or, or other possible uses of those funds. Did you go through a prioritizing process or I know Captain Tyler's been after this vehicle for almost 10 years, but uh, uh, what sort of decision making led you to us today? Part of the equitable, equitable sharing agreement that, that we go into with the Department of Justice is to use confiscated funds only for certain items related to police work. <clears throat> and equipment is the obvious, obvious uh, item that we can use, and this is directly related to some of the emergency situations we're involved, when, involved with. Other, other items would include training um, and smaller items such as, such as weapons. Um, I would, if I were you, I would ask the next question is, can't we use this money for personnel? Um, I, I, could, um, I could put more people to work for sure, but part of the agreement is not to supplant funds that are available in the budget or um, in the city at the time. So I can't use this money to replace police officers at this time. Could you use it to train them? Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean and to, we and we have used mean confiscated him, funds for training. Uh, our drug and gang unit uh, often uses the money for uh, for their type of training. Yes. All right. And during the past, you pick the increment of time. How often has the need been in this community, or in the county, or in Janesville for use of this vehicle? Uh, the, the needs, uh, the opportunities seem to be coming closer together than they have. And they have been. Uh, we can point to some recent situations where vehicles like this were used in Jefferson County, uh, where our tactical team helped support uh, three other tactical teams, and uh, with uh, a total of four of these vehicles. Um, we've had situations in uh, Dane County, where we've been invo involved with in Winnebago County. Uh, so uh, they seem to be they seem to be cropping up more often. However, this vehicle isn't used just for um, the type of dangerous tactical situation where someone has a weapon. They can be used for high-risk search warrants where people, um, people may have weapons or, or where we don't need to put our officers in harm's way approaching a house. They can use this vehicle to get there. There's a lot more situations than the one we can use it at than uh, the typical ones that you see on television. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you made reference to some of the uh, counties surrounding us. Uh, where do they get their vehicles from? Uh, does, for example, the National Guard have a cache of these vehicles, and could we use one when the, the need comes up from time uh, to time? As far as I know, the National Guard does not. Uh, Dane County has a vehicle. Winnebago County, Illinois has a vehicle. Uh, we've been partners with them on operations with the use of their vehicles. Some of our people are trained in the, in the use of it. Um, this would add another dimension to safety for officers and citizens in the northern Illinois, uh, central, south Wisconsin area. Uh, it would provide a vehicle between Dane County and Winnebago County, Illinois for support of operations all up and down uh, the interstate. And presumably have a little bit quicker access to it than having to get it from Madison or from Rockford or wherever. Uh, yes. Uh, the captain pointed out an analogy for me, which I, I'm going to try to remember to repeat, is when you have a fire in a house and you're up on the fourth floor, you can't wait for the, uh, the long ladder truck to come from Madison. And some of the situations that were tactical situations we're involved with are very similar, uh, that we need a vehicle within uh, 30 minutes, uh, 60 minutes at the most, when you're talking about uh, safety, especially if, if uh, someone has been hurt and you need to rescue them. You can't wait that long. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm familiar certainly with the need for it. I, I think we had a discussion at one point uh, a number of years ago when I was working as an assistant district attorney, a prosecuted individual who, uh, in a domestic abuse uh, situation out in the county, in the farm situation, the uh, sheriff's department officer pulled in, uh, the individual uh, cranked off a shotgun round above his head and dropped the weapon back down toward him and said, the next one's coming at you. Uh, the officer got behind his car door and was able to try and back out and he got stuck. And the incident fortunately resulted in, in no death taking place. But if you had access to this vehicle, uh, it might have had a different sort of protective capacity for the officer. However, it would have been over before you could have had a chance to mobilize this thing. 
So I, I guess I'm conflicted a little bit. I certainly see the need for officer safety in, in a, a scenario where it could be used, but most of the time it isn't going to be doing anything except sitting there using as a training platform. I have a bit of a conflict here. For sure. sure. Well, I, I suspect that it will be used quite a bit for training. Um, any piece of equipment that we have usually doesn't sit too long because our units need to be proficient in it, otherwise they shouldn't be using it. So between the three agencies, I suspect you'll see it uh, driving around the county quite a bit. Uh, oftentimes the teams have an opportunity to go up to uh, Fort McCoy and do some training or they'll go up and train with uh, Dane County, which we do operations with, or, or Winnebago County. So it will be used. Um, we're seeing that this unit is used for a, lo a, lot, a lot more um, exercises and a lot more operations. I think we're going to find some more uses for it than the obvious. And you probably can't answer this with any degree of certainty, but do you anticipate a continued flow of drug money sufficient to meet some of the expenses for maintenance, training, and uh, uh, to cover the cost so that it doesn't come out of the general fund? Uh, yes, I do. I don't see a decline in... I don't see a decline in the money that comes in. I expect, as a matter of fact, some more money to come in next year because I've just signed some of the paperwork for it. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll, I'll quickly interject that I, I, I hope very much that there isn't, that that money does dry up rapidly. All right. <coughs> um, Councilor before us. Thank you. Well, uh, given it's, it's less frequent use, I'm I think it makes sense that this is a collaborative effort and kudos uh, for looking at a needed piece of equipment and how to make it most cost effective for us. So I'm pleased that, first of all, this is a collaboration among area municipality uh, police departments, which we have encouraged as a body. So thank you for that. And secondly, I, I don't want to put a price tag on officer safety. These are the highest risk situations that we're placing them in. And so um, I'm pleased that it will certainly increase their safety and effectiveness. So. Um, for me, this, this makes sense. Um, and so uh, despite that it might not get as much use as perhaps uh, my colleague's referring to, I think hence the reason why it's, it's a shared vehicle, so that it could be used uh, across the area. So thank you. Councilor Spritzer. Uh, thank you. A couple of questions. Um, uh, just to uh, clarify what you said about uh, what this money can and can't be used for more generally. Uh, you said it can't be used to replace items in the budget. Uh, in terms of personnel, um, is, is there any point in the future that it could be used for additional personnel beyond what we have the budget for otherwise, or is that generally a no-no? I'll, I'll give you an example. If we were able to add another person into our drug and gang unit, uh, we could use some of that money to um, to support that position, but I would need another another person. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you an example of something that we're hoping to use some of that extra money for is remove some of the items that we have in the, in the budget, in the CIP budget, uh, with money that we have above and beyond the money that we're asking you to allocate tonight. And about how much money does that, is that an annual amount that we get and what is the average? It's not, it's, it's not consistent at all. Uh, in the past, we've, we've gotten approximately $50,000 a year, and it's been accumulating. Uh, we have a considerable amount more than that with, with the last uh, drug arrest that we made with our task force. Uh, and then related to this vehicle, um, do you have a, any estimate of the cost of uh, the training and driving it around the county as part of that, that uh, annually, uh, either for Beloit or for the three uh, entities combined, um, what that would add to costs? Uh, pro I'm approximately $1,500, I'm, I'm going to guess. However, um, part of the MOU is when the vehicle is used, it has to be returned with fuel in it. So there won't be the operating costs. It'll be main maintenance costs for us. Um, and then ab about how many times do you think uh, each year we would actually uh, either either Beloit or uh, Beloit, Janesville, Rock County, uh, use this in a in an actual you know tactical situation i would i'm going to estimate three and as it becomes better known three to five uh, we'll get requests from out outlying counties uh, especially rock county will uh, because at uh, these operations uh, we never go with one unit to these operations there's always support units that go and especially when they go for long periods of time. That's, that's why we need multiple uh, SWAT teams in the area for support from each team, because they can only work for four to six hours and they need to be replaced. 
Thank you. Sure. All right, Chief. Uh, so, uh, oh, you, you will. Go, yeah, go ahead. I thought you were skipping over. No, that's good. I'll let it go this time. Right. Chief, I applaud you and the department and the uh, for partnering partnering with the uh, city of Janesville and the Rock County in getting a much much needed apparatus, which will be kept in Beloit. And uh, you basically got it at half cost because it's refurbished. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and we're getting it at half cost again with the other agencies. Uh, also partnering partnering with us, and uh, as far as keeping it in in Belight goes, I know there's been discussion about that, but we uh, we hope to keep it out near the interstate, uh, where it has easy access to the rest of the rest of the county, um, and it, so it's even though it's here, it's um, it's a multi-jurisdiction vehicle. I want to thank Captain Tyler for his perseverance too. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we'll get on to my question. Uh, what vehicle was available for these uses before? Uh, well, it started back in the in the 80s with a yellow school bus, and <laughs> then it moved up to a green panel van uh, with no ballistic protection, and that has been it. There, it we have no no vehicle uh, to protect our people to go into situations uh, where there's uh, weapons involved. So you're not able to, you haven't been able at all to get a hold of someone to come down with a protected vehicle with some ballistic resistance? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't. We have had, we have had vehicles from uh, Dane County and Winnebago County here for high risk search warrants. Yes, we have had them in, on occasion. Okay, but that would, that took a lot of uh, forethought. And planning. Well, th those are pre-planned events, and okay. and uh, there's a difference between a pre-planned event where we can contact another jurisdiction and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to have a high-risk search warrant, and that works great. And uh, w none of us have any problems with that. It's the rescue-type vehicles, the rescue events, where we might have to um, um, go into a situation and help a citizen out where if someone is, has a weapon or our officers need to go in immediately and they can't wait for another vehicle where time really matters. So that's the big difference between this and borrowing other units or sharing units from counties away. Okay, thank you. Councilor DeForest, do you have additional Yeah, comments? I just wanted to make sure as clarification that the the confiscated funds that are provided, we can't use those as subplants, so those could not be used to hire a police officer. Is that correct? Because that's an issue or a question that will be raised by the public. Correct. We can't hire we can't hire a long-term police officer. You can use it for short-term police officers, but then you have to make a promise that you're going to keep those officers. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing uh, this passes 6-0. Uh, now on to item 11B. A resolution approving a joint agreement with the School District of Beloit for tru Truancy Intervention Coordinator. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you again, Mr. President. Uh, the agreement before you uh, uh, is basically a renewal of prior agreements we've had with the school district. Uh, in some years past, uh, the school district had a truancy intervention coordinator, but uh, that person was only available during the nine normal months of the school year and not available during the summer. The municipal court conducts court during the summer months, and uh, as that person worked closer and closer with the municipal court, it became apparent that there would be a, a a great benefit in in having those services available during the summer months. The city, uh, a few years back, agreed to fund 25 percent of that position for the school. It's a school employee, a school uh, uh, position. We agreed to pick up 25 percent of it so the person could work through the summer months. Uh, the program has been uh, very successful. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, truancy intervention coordinator attends each Thursday set of municipal court during the juvenile portion when the truancy cases come in. Uh, the estimated cost uh, uh, for the upcoming year uh, is uh, just slightly over 13000 I think $13,011. Uh, 
the municipal court already included that uh, in last year's budget. There's no direct budget implications. Um, and uh, we recommend the council approve this, uh, allowing this arrangement to continue. And I'll obviously answer any questions. Second. Motion by Lubke, second by uh, Vanda Bogart. Councilor DeForest. Thank you. I'd just like to make a comment. I'm pleased with this collaboration between the City Council and the School District of Beloit. Um, from the, the last uh, outcomes that I've seen, um, this program works in terms of trying to catch uh, students um, who are <coughs> starting to experience uh, truancy issues and really uh, intervene to, to try to address their issues. So. I'm, I'm very pleased um, with this initiative. Um, Fred Atlas has done a wonderful job connecting with the kids and really making a difference so that doesn't become an ongoing problem um, for the school and for the city. So I'm um, pleased with uh, this collaboration. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, call the, the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes 6-0. Item 11C. A resolution approving a commercial offer to purchase for the property located at 232 Sherland Avenue. And uh, I, I think I'll go ahead and start with this okay. one, and then if there are any additional questions or comments for the city attorney, we'll certainly take care of that before we ask you to vote. Um, now, this property, uh, as indicated, is located at 232 Sherlin Avenue. It's actually on the south side of Sherlin Avenue, currently owned by the Overflowing Cup Total Life Center Incorporated. Uh, this is a parcel of property we've had our eye on for some time. We'd like to acquire and clean this particular side of uh, Sherlin Avenue in anticipation of that new, what we're referring to as the Confluence Park being built in the city of South Beloit. This would give us an opportunity to acquire this property. Uh, part of which is in the state of Wisconsin, uh, would be titled to the city. Part of it is in the state of Illinois, would be titled to South Beloit, very similar to what we did uh, with the old uh, salvaging yard here uh, a few years ago. Our plan would be to demo the building, uh, restore the site. Uh, there's also remnants of an old service station left next door. Um, that has, uh, is in the process of being taken by Rock County under a, a property tax foreclosure. We also plan to acquire that property this fall. We've applied for a grant through DNR to facilitate the brownfield cleanup. And then we would own all those properties, uh, which would be uh, uh, theoretically at least part of the frontage for the new South Beloit Park. I also want to add that the service station piece, we're going to acquire that for through the uh, water uh, uh, or the, uh, the sewer utility uh, so that uh, we can add to the space of that building there. So that'll be coming to you probably later in the fall when we get that deal negotiated. Uh, for this particular uh, piece of property, we've had uh, some very good discussions with Reverend Dave Paul Garud. We've uh, come to, I think, a good set of terms. Uh, the purchase price would be $75,000. We're also recommending that you uh, allow a $5,000 relocation expense. Uh, Reverend Paul Garut has a lot of storage in this building. There's a lot of stuff that has to be moved and relocated. Uh, we also have provided some minor miscellaneous provisions allowing uh, for a sale to be conducted on the property prior to closing. Uh, there's a provision in the contract that we will allow uh, the overflowing cup uh, to have one uh, weekend, mutually agreed weekend per year, in one of the city's park sites. Uh, they run uh, uh, on a kind of an outreach program, a mini festival, if you will, uh, to uh, make their services known to the community, and that would be provided at, at no rent. Uh, we've agreed on a closing uh, timeline for the end of the month would take possession around the 25th of September. And of course, this is one of those last uh, little items that we're trying to get completed this summer because we would be using revenue from TID 5, not general purpose tax revenues for this acquisition and would eventually become part of the redevelopment again along that portion of Sherlin Avenue. Uh, 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 Councilor, do you, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, or, or should we just go to counselor questions at this point and deal deal with any questions that counselors have? I might mention just before the, the meeting started, Pastor Dave did uh, drop off uh, uh, signed copies of, of the draft agreement, and this has always been subject to council approval. If council does approve it, 
the manager would then execute tomorrow. Any questions? We'll be happy to answer. Okay. I'll make a motion for acceptance. Loop keep moves for approval. Second. And second by DeForest. All right, let's start with Councilor Van de Bogart. Uh, you made reference, uh, Mr. Arf, to what percentage of the property uh, is in Wisconsin, what percentage is in, in Illinois, and are we going to receive any monies back from South Beloit for our buying it for them, essentially? The building and the property that the city set out to acquire is actually all in Wisconsin, and that was part of the negotiation, and that's what the money is for. Now, the piece in the uh, uh, state of Illinois is actually vacant. Uh, there's a, a the back end of the parking lot sets on that parcel over the state line. We really don't want to take the property out of state. So we've contacted South Lloyd and they've agreed to take that property. <clears throat> Again, we negotiated for the building, the lands up front that are in the state of Wisconsin. So we did not ask South Lloyd to share in any of the purchase costs. All right. And how was the uh, figure 75 and 5 arrived at? Uh, negotiated. Certainly in line with the appraised, well below the appraised value, in line with the assessed value on the building. All right, thank you. Councilor Spritzer. Thank you. Uh, I know that uh, we're looking to get this done with TIF 5 funds. Uh, would the demolition be able to be covered under TIF 5, or do we have to wait until general purpose revenues are available to do that? <clears throat> no, we're also planning on doing that. Um, in fact, our public works staff that handles this kind of demolition work has already started and we'll be inspecting the buildings if the deal is approved tonight fairly shortly and we'll start getting our specifications together. Uh, if we have issued the contract prior to the 26th of September, we can go ahead and complete the work after that date. But everything must be encumbered or contracted for by the 26th of September. So we'll make sure that that, in fact, is the case with regard to the demolition. So, so it will be paid part of the TIF district. So I take it the idea is basically to close on the 25th and sign the contract the next day for the... Well, actually close on the um, uh, late in, in, in August we're going to close. And then we'll take All possession right. on the 25th okay. of September. Uh, we're anticipating that the demolition, which starts with asbestos removal, would begin very soon thereafter, but probably not be completed until mid-October. Thank you. Are there any estimated costs for uh, topsoil um, uh, plantings and so forth? No, we're not planning on doing a lot with it. We have uh, topsoil, black dirt in, in stock, and we plan on seeding it when we get done. In fact, that'll probably be a part of the demolition contract. We usually build that in to the demolition contract, so they'll come in and, and top it off when they get everything removed. Councilor DeForest. We're not, I just thought of this, we're not anticipating any issues where, where the DNR will say we'll have to cap the site at all or anything. I mean, it's it's not an established brownfield, so I'm no, assuming not, we're not disturbing the soil, correct? No, not a brownfield site, not disturbing the soil, we're removing the improvements. We will be capping it to some extent because we will you know, skim off the parking lot and we will put a black dirt cap on it. But we're not envisioning getting into the ground. Don't envision any brownfield issues. If we do encounter anything, obviously, uh, we'll have to deal with it. But we've worked with DNR, as you know, on a great many of these brownfield issues over the years, including getting the necessary grants if that's required. But at this time, it is not a brownfield site. Okay. Thank you. Any other councillor questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll call the. I'd oh, like to make one further comment, oh, Mr. Go ahead. I've uh, thought through this, and I certainly can agree that it's an eyesore, and and I don't object to the uh, the concept of the park and, and acquiring it, but I am going to vote against this. I think the price is far too high. The five thousand dollar relocation is far too high. The forgiveness of the property taxes is inappropriate, and those are the reasons I'm going to vote against. And not because I think it's a bad idea. I just think it's too expensive. But, okay. Thank you. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Item passes 5 1 with uh, Councillor Van de Bogart in dissension. Item 11 D. A resolution supporting the construction of Inman Parkway extension alternative for the County Highway G connector. Mr. Flash. Yes, Mr. President, we are going to start with the engineer's presentation. 
if I have any comments to add at the end, I will do that or help with the questions. But I want Mr. Flash to explain this and give all the technical background. Very good. This project will construct a connector between County Highway G and County Highway S, also known as Prairie Avenue and Chapeer Roads, respectively, on the northeast side of the city of Beloit that will provide improved access to the Interstate 3990 corridor and divert traffic from the local streets in that area. The state of Wisconsin desires to use this connector and County Highway G as an alternate route for the I-3990, both during and after the 3990 construct reconstruction. Rock County and the state of Wisconsin are lead agencies for this project. The Rock County Board will select a preferred alternative route for this connector at a meeting in September. Ayers and Associates is the design consultants that the, the, the leads have hired to do this work, and there will be a public information meeting on Monday, August 27th, I believe, at Aldrich Middle School from 6 to 8 p.m. You're all invited, too. You'll get your invites probably via email tomorrow. Mine came today. So I'll forward mine on to you all. The map that was attached to your packets indicates the locations of the alternative routes. Um, if you want to refer to that map, the red route is the no build. The blue route is the alternative two, which would improve existing routes known as Philhower Road and also add a new connection from Philhower down to Chopier Road. And the green routes is shown there, I believe there's four of them is known as the Eamon Parkway extension and one of those four routes is um, acceptable potentially as known as the Eamon extension in quarters that have been previously um, mapped by the city. The no build alternative will use the existing Prairie Avenue, Cranston Road and Chopier Road and would not remove traffic from the local streets or improve interstate access. It's just as is and from a technical standpoint we do not deem that as um, desirable for the city of Beloit. Alternative two would improve Philhower Road and add a new connection to County Trunk Highway S. This redirects traffic too far north from the Prairie Avenue business areas and the business corridor to be beneficial to the city and therefore from that technical aspect we did not deem that to be very desirable for the city either. The alternatives 1A through D is known as the Eamon Parkway Extension, it closely follows the quarters that were officially mapped by the city in 1970. That was the Prairie Avenue to Creek Road and in 2004 from Creek Road to Chopier Road. Um, alternative 1A through D provides the most direct linkage to the interstate um, between G and S and has the greatest benefits to the Northeast Business Corridor and diverts traffic from the local streets. Therefore, we find that one from a technical standpoint to be the most desirable. The existing intergovernmental agreement between Rock County and the city for this corridor, where the city is paying for a portion of the design for the, that is within the city limits, was based on the Inman Parkway extension. In fact, that all started from an a, um, application for an earmark that the city had started oh, probably in 2006, maybe a little before that, which was a surprise to get, but we did get it. And then we moved that on with to the county as we realized it was much more of a county connection than a city of Beloit connection and route. But uh, so that's why we are participating in that. Um, by selecting alternative 1A through D, the most direct route, it's between 39 and 90, more people will use this corridor than any of the other two and the improved access to the interstate will better serve the existing businesses in both the city of Beloit, the town of Beloit, business districts, and the town of Turtle. And by giving them better access to, to the, the major transportation corridors. So that's why the engineering division is recommending approval of the resolution attached, selecting any one of the alternatives 1A through D, which is the Inman Parkway extension as the city's preferred connector between Highway G and Highway S. Questions? And move approval, Mr. Move. President. Second. No, I move by, move, sure, move by Vandenbogart, second by Luke Key. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started with Councillor Vandenbogart. Can you outline roughly, I know you can't be held uh, directly to this, the various costs involved in the three options? Uh, it seems to me that the, the no build option, bringing it in all the way into the city and then north. Uh, is, a, is a costly option because it will result in very rapid deterioration 
of already existing city infrastructure that has not been built to interstate standards and not been built to handle the loads. And so what you're talking about really is a deferred cost onto the taxpayers of the city of Beloit that won't be known for two years or five years or ten years or something oh. like that. And your other two, uh, when you talk about Phil Hauer, you're going to have to acquire not only the right-of-way in the property, but you're going to have to relocate all those houses and people that live along Phil Hauer Road. Has, have people put a pencil and paper to this and figured out the costs? That will all be revealed on Monday night to everyone. I don't have the exact dollar values. The no build is a misnomer in my opinion. It just means that the corridors currently exist. It does not mean that there would not be costs to, incurred to bring them to design standards. Yeah. Um, the state of Wisconsin is not really interested in the participating in a no build or that current existing roadways corridors at this point. So it, in, in honest, all honesty, there is through the, the process of this, this is part of the public particip participation process required by the state and federal funding issues. And you always do a no build. You do one or two alternate routes beyond the no build. Mm -hmm. The no build falls away, because, in my opinion, because it does not meet the project's purpose and need, and that's what they're determining, and they will express more of that at the, at the meeting on Monday night as to all of that. I don't want to steal their thunder. They haven't actually given me the dollars. That would be a costly, lengthy route, and it doesn't doesn't really work well. well the other two with Phil Hauer, yes, there will have to be at least two homes probably acquired with relocation from the early stuff that I've looked at. Um, I am not the lead agency on this. Our city is not, so I only get snippets of pictures of how the progress is moving forward. But from the communications I have received, the land required between the Phil Hauer alternative and the um, alternatives 1A through D, the Inman extension for right-of-way acquisition falls within just a couple of tenths of an acre of each other, and I can't remember which one was more or less, but a couple of tenths of an acre is not a lot of land. Mm -hmm. Well, as I understand the manufacturing plant on, uh, on County G making the precast concrete, they're, they're, they're cranking out beams, concrete beams that are in excess of, I'm not sure, somebody said 100 feet long. Really long ones, yes. And to bring those, for example, all the way into the city of Beloit, making a, a turn onto Cranston Road, and then making another turn, you talk, you're talking major traffic impediments, and it, it simply wouldn't work. You can't have a 100-foot beam making these corners, 90-degree corners. It's, it's just right. And they probably would not be able to take their real exceptionally long ones that way. Let's hope those would all have to go north. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank the other you. The thing here, if I may, if you look at this alignment, um, these things were put together, these alternatives by some people opposed to the project. They're not really workable the way they're shown. Uh, if the no-build option is, is the one that's ultimately approved, all of that traffic is going to come down. Prairie Avenue to Cranston and stay on Cranston Road all the way through the city of Beloit's residential neighborhoods until they get to 81 Milwaukee Road and they'll get on the interstate at that location. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that, you know, our residents take note of that. Uh, Monday night is your, is your opportunity, 6 to 8, to come out to this briefing session. Uh, county officials will be there. The design people will be there. I don't know if anybody in the state will be there or not. There's always, There's always a project manager. Of some sort. And, and that might be the management consultant instead of the true state representative. But a, it's hired by the state to, yeah, to, to hear those voices. An opportunity to voice your concern uh, about that plan uh, to dump all that additional fairly heavy truck traffic into the city's residential neighborhoods when there's an opportunity here to build a linkage uh, with a pretty direct tie into this area that would, would serve uh, this new manufacturer well and would be a direct tie to the interstate at, uh, at, at uh, 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 just drop the name. Chopier Road. Chopier, thank you. You bet. Councilor DeForest. Thank you. Um, Mr. Flash, do you have any idea of approximately how many acres of land would need to be acquired that's currently being used in for farming for the Inman option? No, I don't have that, but they will have that there on, on Monday night. They, have, they will have a matrix of comparisons of the three alternatives, and all of that will be 
be presented, I'm quite sure. If not, they can answer that question. Okay, which which leads me to question. I will I ask that Monday for you and get back to you. Thank you, or I will ask it. If you're there, then you can do it yourself. <laughs> which leads me to a question that I had asked you earlier, too. Um, because a lot of this information is coming later, is there a reason why we have to make this decision now? Why can't sure. we wait till after that meeting, have all the information in front of us, and make a better informed decision? Well, we need to go in as the well I, I guess in my opinion my professional opinion um given all the transportation aspects and everything else the one stellar alternative is the inman extension for our community the the issue at hand is what is best for us for our community and our constituents and to have that voice so that we can be heard loud and clear through that process they will you're allowed to send back in comments but that the period of time is short so for us to be able to have that be entered into the official records of the project we need to have it now or we'd be beyond the comment period for that meeting i mean i, I do understand you know that in this position here my primary concern is for the residents of the city but you know, we keep talking about collaboration, taking a more regional approach. I do want to work with our, our neighbors to figure Indeed. out if there's ways that we can tackle this mm -hmm. that are win-win, not only for just thinking about the city right. of Blake, but thinking about our neighbors and what their needs and concerns are. I mean, could you share some of the objections they've raised to this option? Is there a way that we can work with them to sure. address this? Sure, probably not, but um, we, we try. The, the biggest objection is farmland preservation. And like I said, the difference between an existing corridor and a new corridor is, is a couple of tenths of an acre, knowing that there's 43,000 square feet in an acre, a little bit more than that. Um, a tenth of an acre is like 4,000 square feet, a big house. <laughs> We're talking very, very minimal differences in land acquisition. Um, put on a, a metropolitan planning organization hat, which is very much in support of that from the regional aspect. And it's been discussed at many, many different meetings at the MPO. Uh, the town of Turtle has always been very negative because they didn't want to have any farmland impacted. But um, one of the problems with our community is you can't seem to be able to get there from here from a traffic standpoint, from a, a roadway corridor standpoint. And it was prior generations short-sightedness on not reserving corridors that, get me don't get me wrong they had the foresight in 1970 to reserve this corridor to afford us that opportunity to build it now when the money is available and from a traffic engineering standpoint you want major arterials and minor arterials about a mile to a half mile apart majors a mile apart minors a half mile in between to collect them so this is the next logical location for this if you look at our overall map on the city of beloit we have a connector that goes from where this one will hit show pier over to meet with um freeman parkway extended north and connect an almost an inner you know and the next inner loop between the interstate to get people from point a to point b so it's really uh, an integral part of our long-term transportation planning it's not a a short-sighted knee-jerk reaction to have something be made just because it doesn't make sense i mean there was a lot of thought in the modeling that went into this as a potential quarter before we even received um total funding and it's been on um, will we make them happy? Probably not. Will the generations beyond us thank us? Probably so. Um, and it's a hard one. And we need to plan for our future so we can make it be good for those that follow. Is there any possibility that if we were to to choose the no build option that we could we could get some of those costs from some of the partners in the area? I mean, or is that really well, going to fall on the city of Beloit? It would fall on the city of Beloit. We'll be taking the brunt of, mm -hmm. of the deteriorating of our roads. It would, it would fall totally on us. The town of Turtle, the town of Beloit, don't even want to participate in this one. We, we volunteered to participate with the Inman Extension to the extent that it was within our community, the one-third of it length that was in our community to pay a portion of the local share right now we're looking at um i believe it's 80 20 or 70 30 funding i, th I think it is the 70 30 right larry i believe i believe it's a 70 30 funding 70 percent state and federal 
thirty percent local and we pay one third of the local share um, that's pretty amazing for what we will have as a potential benefit in the future All right, thank you it should be noted also that we have explained to the town of turtle officials that this is going to be a rural uh, lettered county road a two-lane rural cross-section there will be no water no sewer utilities put in here the not even purpose, street lights purpose for this connector is exactly that to connect to uh, both that new concrete casting operation up in the town of uh, turtle uh, also there's a lot of other truck traffic that uses this routing coming out of the various material yards and quarries that are in operation up in that area and it provides uh, a better improved access to the uh, Beloit Hospital, to the uh, commercial properties that operate in the north end of Beloit along Prairie Avenue, and also improves uh, or, or creates substantially improved access to the town of Beloit's business district as well. The, all of their in industry, all their major businesses are located primarily south of Inman Parkway in that business park or corridor. They will also get improved access by this routing. Councilor DeForest, did you have Sorry, a comment? I just comment? had one more question. I want to make sure for clarification that the city is blocked from annexing this area. Is that correct? I just want to make sure. We that have a boundary agreement with the town of Turtle, and that's included in the boundary agreement, which will not expire until 2022 ish. Something like that. It's got about. And, uh, well, just under 10 years. Just under 10 years, I think. I think it was extended in, uh, in 02. Or, uh, Right, yeah, 22 it runs out. Yeah, I think it's 22 that it runs out. 21 or 22. Yeah, we're precluded from annexing property, which is another thing that makes no sense. Their, their primary concern is that we're going to build a new road, which is going to lead to development. Okay? And that if development were to occur in that area, it would have to annex into the city in order to obtain sewer service. That's what they're frightened of. May I interject? And, and if we had, you know, first of all, we have hundreds of acres of land where we have industrial quality streets, not rural roads where we have water and sewer already built in in place that we've invested in, uh, where we have the land all properly zoned, uh, annexed. Uh, we own a lot of it uh, through our uh, the Greater Blood Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, we don't need more land for business development. We've got all of that much better position than this parcel. All right. Well, we don't know for sure what's going to happen here in the future. Uh, they don't either, and, and that's the bottom line. That's what they're fearful of is that, heaven forbid, the evil city might go out and recruit business and create jobs in, in this particular uh, uh, part of the uh, community. I don't think that's going to happen. It's prohibited by our annexation agreement at this time. The road is not being built to support that kind of development, and if that ever occurred up there, it would require a huge additional expenditure to upgrade that to industrial standard to put in all the utilities to support it. So uh, it, it's, it's basically a non-issue. But that's what they're frightened of, and, and they believe that if that road goes in, there's a good possibility that someday that will develop. Mr. Fleisch, did you want to ask? Yeah, as another, and as another aspect of the design and acquisition of right-of-way for that corridor, it will be access controlled, which means that you're not going to see a driveway every 200 feet, 100 feet, 300 feet. It'll be only allowed to come in off of connecting streets that would be built to support any development of lands beyond the roadway corridor. So, and those are almost predetermined as part of the design because of site distances, et cetera. So the property owners on either side of the remaining, you know, of the new corridor right of way would have to sell off a large chunk and build the infrastructure to provide that access. They will not be allowed a driveway. They will have to access on streets by the way this is being set up. And that's to help protect against little parcels being cut off and developed and and having the, the whole purpose of this was to be a people and, and goods mover great thank you i just wanted to make sure that we have you that fear addressed you bet i mean um we've tried very hard to make sure that those concerns were addressed and, and that's why we're not doing any extension of sewer and water or even street lighting except for at the intersections so um thank you their voices are heard <laughs> Councilor Kincaid. It appears that no matter what we offer to do to accommodate them, we're not getting any cooperation whatsoever. That would appear that way, yes. Why would we cooperate with them then? 
because it makes sense for some of the things that, that we're offering to them makes sense for us in the long term too like the controlled access etc because it'll be make it better for our citizens in the future when development does occur so do get in, something out of it you bet in in some in as some future our, date as long as the corridor that we we prefer right as long as it's the Emmon Parkway extension that's why we want to have our voice yeah. be heard and taken into account because they've been out um, championing their position where we've been relatively quiet and reserved and kept it to the very technical aspects yeah. now it's time for us to, in my opinion to voice our political voice too yours um, would the residents of the township or the uh, those who are uh, uh, administering it would they agree or like the idea of being able to uh, subdivide five acres here or there for uh, I would think the farmers might like to they send their kid to college or whatever I they I'm are corporate farms I'm not they're not the family farms okay. so it's I'm hard to have an that opinion it's a good thing believe me I'm just well, really wondering where the uh, uh, where the landowners are coming from I cannot express okay. more than okay. they say it's going to be farmed okay thank you well, I'll put in my my two cents worth and I'll go ahead and talk about the 800 pound grill in the room their objections are breathless hysteria and paranoia uh, this this makes sense for for us uh, you know asking the taxpayers of the city of Beloit to bear the entire brunt of deteriorating streets just so that the uh, just to assuage the the terror of, 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 the, of the town of turtle is unacceptable uh, do we have any other uh, questions or comments all right I'll, I'll call the issue all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed item passes 6-0 item 11 e a, res <clears throat> a resolution awarding the classification and compensation study and pay plan development contract uh, thank you mr. president members of the council um, <clears throat> the resolution that you're uh, considering this evening for uh, paying classification study really is culmination of uh, an event we sent out an RFP uh, recently to consulting firms uh, to take a look at the city's uh, paying classification study which is been in place uh, since the late 1990s it's about 15 years old uh, it currently covers uh, only the city's uh, non-union represented employees and as you know as a result of some changes that took place last year with the state budget uh, a number of our employees now are no longer union members uh, and are going to become uh, incorporated uh, into our uh, non-represented pay plan and because of that and, and also in as a result of the age of the current paying classification plan we felt uh, it's imperative uh, to have some way uh, take a professional look uh, at the current plan uh, it needs to be updated uh, and uh, we did uh, receive proposals from four consultants uh, to do that uh, we had a committee uh, that was put together uh, to meet uh, with the uh, consultants that submitted proposals uh, interviewed them and uh, as a result of that process uh, they have recommended the uh, proposal from uh, McGrath uh, incorporated uh, as being the uh, proposal that best meets uh, the needs of the city to conduct this study and uh, they have agreed uh, to perform their work uh, for a little bit less than $15,000 <coughs> Uh, we do have <coughs> sufficient funds in our uh, human resources department budget this year that uh, can accommodate this and uh, we're recommending uh, the city council authorize us to enter into a contact contract with McGrath uh, to perform the required work and with that I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have any motion to approve I move approval Spritzer and seconded by Lubke. Councilor Vandebogart. Why such, if you if you know, why such a separate level of uh, uh, quotes on the re request for proposals all the way from 15,000 up to 45,000? And then the second question is how does this mesh or does this mesh with our handbook 
that we're going to be reviewing in a week or so. Our employee handbook, does it, is there a conflict or does it work with it? Well, the first question uh, I really can't address. I wasn't part of the group that, that interviewed the firm, so I'm not sure why there's, you know, such a large disparity as far as the uh, price of the contract. Well, you want to introduce the consultant? Oh. Name. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. McGrath is here this evening. She's oh. uh, the head of the consulting All firm. Right. And, and Well, I'll ask her the question. <laughs> Ma'am, you're about three times lower than the other folks. How come? <laughs> I like Beloit. Um, no, uh, I have been doing consulting for almost uh, 10 years, 12 years now. Um, when I did initially bid the price, we were in the upper 20s, a little bit low 30s. However, I'm fully aware that there have been numerous compensation studies done throughout the region. I know what those went for, and so I bid it uh, competitively with what other firms have been doing within this area in order to ascertain the city of Beloit. Would I like to get more? Sure, and if you want to vote for it, that's fine with me, <laughs> but right now, our price is the price, and we have never increased a price once we have a signed contract. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In the second half of your question, yeah, how does it work with the employee handbook that we're going to be looking um, at next week? It's really a separate issue, basically. Uh, that's really our personnel policy handbook. I mean, there, there could be, uh, you know, some influence uh, that that exerts over the study, but primarily uh, that's to cover... Uh, essentially how employees are are supervised uh, the rules of employment for the city what have you uh, this is purely to look at our our positions uh, the pay associated with those positions with the work that's being performed and how we compare not only internally among all the departments uh, for similar type positions but but also externally with the employers that we have to compete with okay. Also, uh, if I may, the personnel manual that you're going to be reviewing next week envisions this pay study being done. Definitely. It basically locks in place the three existing pay plans uh, that uh, we have for what are now our non-represented employees. Uh, we have the non-represented plan that's referred to in the manual, and then there are two uh, uh, step plans that the unions were using. Uh, the manual then uh, goes on to indicate that the new plan, once prepared and adopted, would be implemented January the 1st of 2013. So the manual envisions this work being done and the plan being prepared this fall for implementation with the new budget cycle. Obviously, we would not do this in a mid-year situation under any uh, circumstances. So that's the timeline. That's the way the two will work together. Okay. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. Um, thank you. I, my, my question for the most part was answered because I know there was a reference that the that proposed the consultant would also provide recommendations on rewarding employee performance and um, so I'm assuming then we haven't seen the handbook yet that the the merit pay aspect of it will be quite vague or are we are we waiting for recommendations on how to handle things like merit pay or well, we haven't started work on the contract yet. I, right. I think we should let the consultant come in, do the comparables. Let's see where the salary plan, how it, 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 it comes together, and then we'll present that uh, to council as soon as we have an outline of what's, you know, what's workable and what solves our problems. We have two issues here. We've got a pay plan that's 15 years old that has not been reworked uh, in a decade and a half, and we've got 155, give or take, uh, formerly unionized employees that are going to be integrating into that plan. So it's going to take a good deal of work to mesh all of that together to do the horizontal and vertical comparables, make sure the plan works not only within the departments but across all the city departments. And so that's what the study is all about. That's why we're using a consultant. Correct. Councilor Kincaid. Uh, Mr. York, um, with the wide range of uh, bids, are, are you satisfied that the uh, $15,000 uh, bid is uh, uh, delivering the same level of services as was proposed on the $45,000? Um, I don't see anything that would indicate otherwise. Uh, you know, again, we, we did issue an RFP. Uh, all the firms, uh, I think there was only one firm that actually wasn't interviewed by the committee, uh, the uh, the committee made a choice based on what services the city 
was interested in and uh, they felt that McGrath you know had the qualifications to perform the work as we specified and and as you've heard this evening the consultant believes that uh, they can do that did the uh, consultants respond to a specific RFP yes 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 they did and we have written responses that will be the basis of the contract the entire scope of services that McGrath will be performing is all laid out in that document and it's very similar uh, to the to the work approach or process that would be used by the other consultants uh, a, a couple of things here uh, one is some of the firms are fairly large they have a lot of overhead the McGrath firm is relatively small and I believe by looking at the office it's in your home yes. uh, there's a there's some consultants that work for you on a part-time basis who are fully employed so they do not have a lot of full-time employees benefit costs and there were overhead issues that allowed them to give us a more competitive price uh, when we looked at it we thought they underpriced uh, their work as well a little bit but again it's the different structure when you look at Springsteen Incorporated who's a very very good firm have a great reputation in Wisconsin but this is a big firm with downtown presence uh, they have uh, very expensive office space they have a lot of full-time employees and uh, there's no way a firm with that carrying that kind of overhead could compete with a smaller independent firm but yes we've reviewed we've reviewed all the qualifications we've checked references we've looked at other uh, cities McGrath has done work for they checked out very very highly and again we have a detailed written scope of service that's part of their proposal I'm a, I, it appears to me having done a, a little consulting myself over the years that uh, you've squeezed pretty hard you um, you include uh, all travel expenses time materials and all other expenses that uh, I yes. guess you'd be commended. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, let's call the uh, motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming up this evening. Item 11F. A resolution authorizing an agreement with Beloit College for the operation of the city's public education, educational, and governmental cable access channel and studio. Mr. York. Um, as you know, the city's contracted for a number of years with uh, Beloit College to provide <coughs> the uh, our PEG access channel uh, programming for our city council meetings. Uh, you know, on Tuesday nights uh, they also uh, offer the community an opportunity for to present uh, various programs on the uh, PEG channel uh, that you wouldn't typically find on uh, a normal uh, TV uh, channel uh, a cable channel um, they also operate our uh, cable access studio uh, it's, it's actually an educational program that the the college is involved with with some of the students and uh, they do quite a bit of uh, programming in the studio we a actually have a, um, a Beloit today program that the city actually produces uh, that's shown uh, through the uh, cable access studio uh, the current agreement that we have with the college expires at the end of this year uh, they approached us oh, a month or so ago with the interest of going ahead and uh, getting the contract renewed uh, upon expiration at the end of this year. Uh, the college has seen the uh, agreement. Uh, they've signed off on it. And uh, we would certainly like to continue this arrangement that we currently have with the college and continue the agreement for an ad additional five-year period. Uh, so it would run from January 1, 2013 uh, to the uh, end of December 2017 is a term on uh, the new agreement with the college and any questions you may have I'll be glad to try to address those do I have a motion councilor DeForest <coughs> second by Luke any questions councilor Van der Bogart. one of my early assignments in my council career was on the cable TV access uh, committee as you recall uh, when they went to a statewide regulation and the local regulation dropped away as, as, as ineffective and not needed, there was some suggestion by the big cable companies that they were moving to eliminate PEG programming across the country. 
I have not kept up on it. Have you heard anything? Are they going to be phasing PEG programming out of their their offerings uh, in general? I mean, we have charter generally, but uh, with all the other potentials that are there, DirecTV among them, uh, has there been any discussion? Is, is PEG going up in popularity or going down or staying the same, or are we, are we going to be out of business there shortly? <clears throat> I'm not aware of any movement by the state or uh, charter to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the new state statute that was enacted a few years ago that allowed the state uh, to do the franchising for the cable companies uh, actually provides uh, for them uh, for the, the PEG channels mm -hmm. uh, through the state statute. So, so it actually preserved uh, our ability to continue uh, offering uh, these type of services through the state statute. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, uh, the state would have to amend that statute in order to eliminate uh, that service. Mm -hmm. I guess charter could go out of business entirely and we wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm certainly not aware of any anything like that. Uh, well, the lobbying that takes place, as you recall, uh, what they, they referred to it as the bill from AT&T, I think, was the, was the right. uh, moniker on it. Uh, and uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about how it affected the rates and com competition, et cetera. Sure. So it could be gone like that uh, if, if they wanted it to be. Well, and AT&T really hasn't become a major player in the city as far as uh, the yeah. TV services that they yeah. offer. There's, uh, I don't know, a 1,000 or 1,200 or so customers, I think, in, in the city that have uh, the AT&T uh, mm. service. But uh, predominantly our cable is provided by charter here in the city. Yeah. And I haven't heard anything on as far as they're concerned about potentially eliminating uh, the PEG uh, access. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. Thank you. My question is related a bit to the, the what I perceive as maybe uncertainty about the future, um, unfortunately, of PEG access. I mean, is there a reason why we're doing a five-year contract and not a contract with a shorter duration? The five years typically the period that we've always used with the college for this this agreement. I don't know if there's anything magic about it. It's what the city's always done in the past with them. Okay, thank you, Mr. York. Is there a termination clause in the contract? Yes. Okay, so if they pull the plug on it, we could stop it. Right. Well, and there's also some language in there in the event charter does, you know, cease, uh, you know, business, what have you, uh, what happens, you know, sure. under this agreement, too, so. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll call the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Issue flat passes uh, six to zero. Uh, Mr. President, I abstain. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. It was it was five uh, with one step abstention. Thank you. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, item number twelve is adjournment. Any no. Moved by DeForest. Okay. Second. Okay. Kincaid second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Zero. We are adjourned. Yes.